Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. Well, I'm going to just start off and just tell you as we try to continue in the series, we're not going to really cover the second part. Uh, in fact, uh, this is just, uh, I don't know if it's a confession, but this is something that I just realized. I was actually taking notes for this sermon because there's some things that I wanted to share, and it came out to 28 pages of notes. Yes, uh, that's, that's literally about, mine is about five or six pages, almost 90% manuscript. So we're looking at close to uh, four, or three or four sermons uh, compact compacted in one sermon. So I cut it down to about uh, 15 or so, and then I had to cut it down even further to about 10, and I realized I still won't be able to cover everything. It's like a two word ser- uh, two sermons worth. And so what I decided to do is pause on the Romans chapter 2, which we're supposed to cover today, and I'm simply calling this the simple gospel revisited, to kind of look back to what we're trying to talk about as we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how important it is. And I would say even more than those of you who might be pre-Christians or you're here just checking out what Christianity is about or even about church, I think this message is more important for those of you who are sitting here and believe that you are a Christian. I am not here to make you question if you're saved or not. But after my message, if it does cause you to question, I think that's a good thing. And what I'm going to pray, and I've been praying, and what I'm going to ask God to do is that he will just bring his Holy Spirit upon this room and convict us, because I cannot convict you. It has to be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm praying not to bring fear or anything like that, but bring a sense of assurance, the blessed assurance that we know that we're saved, and not just saved, but God has, has a greater purpose for us. And I pray that in, in more than anything else, you'll leave here more excited about Jesus and about the gospel than ever before. I also want to pray that there are some of you who do understand the gospel. And for whatever reason, there might be different hindrances for you to try to live this out. And I pray that you'll be more energized and refocused on the things that God has called us to do as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, Last two weeks, pretty much, it's been filled with conferences. It's been busy. Uh, One conference uh, was in Asia here. Another conference was back in the States. So as you know, uh, I I was up late nights just trying to finish off the conferences, U.S. time. And then I had to get up early in the morning because that's when they have their evening sessions. So I was uh, getting up early in the morning. So it's been a it's been a crazy two weeks. It's, It's been very busy. But one thing that I will say is that the first conference that I was a part of, which is the Kada conference, as some of you know, this is where uh, some of my close friends and I, we get together every single year, once a year, and we just kind of talk about different issues in the church at large. We talk about different things that are are happening in our lives and also in around the world and in our churches. And so in this conference, one of the things, and I I think there's a picture up here, so they, they all met together in Austin, Texas, but I was the only one online, but a couple of them were online uh, because one person was feeling sick, so they're like, oh no, do I have COVID or not? And um, so they were all together in Austin, but I was here in Hong Kong, and as we were in this conference together, let me just say, it was literally a paradigm shifting, and in many ways, a lot of challenges for myself as a pastor. What kind of gospel am I preaching over the pulpit? What type of people do we have in our church who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ? So as I was going through this, I mean, every single session, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I was guilty of that. I was guilty of this. And I was thinking to myself, I mean, I might have to rethink about everything. Let me just say that uh, I I did not fall away. I'm still a believer in Jesus Christ, (laughs) just to make sure we're on the same page. But I will say that it has really shaken up a lot of the things that I believe was so foundational that I realized that even though those things are true and they are still true, they will always be true, I've only looked at it from a microscopic 
perspective that was so small that I forgot the bigger picture of all that God is doing. And so it kind of helped me to identify some underpinnings and some foundational things about the gospel once again. And let me kind of couch this story like in, in this framework so that you understand. Let me share it in this way. I've been doing ministry over 30 plus years. I have seen so many people come and go from all different nations. I've traveled to many, many countries around the world and preached the gospel message. And in the midst of all those experiences, one of the things that I've come to the realization is that there were so many people who decided to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then after a certain time, they either fall away or they don't live their lives like the Bible talks about. Now, I relegated that to, well, that's just part of the sanctification process of becoming more like Jesus Christ. That's a part of learning how to let go of the things of this world and try to really live for God and the kingdom of God. But one of the things I realized was that I was guilty or I was a culprit in this was that the gospel that I preached was more for a decision rather than entering into this kingdom of God mindset and a lifestyle that is demanded by the cross of Jesus Christ. I think one time when I really knew that it was bad was when I found myself, and some of you might have heard this before, but I found myself some years back when people decided to come to receive Christ, they would come to the front or whatever it may be, and instead of being overjoyed that someone is actually receiving Christ, I started getting cynical. In fact, it was so bad that in my mind, as they said, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, in my mind I was thinking, okay, let's see how long this will last. That, that was going through my mind. This is a pastor this is kind of like what I'm called to do, to preach the gospel. And this is what was going through my mind because I was so jaded, so cynical of so many Christians who claim to be Christians, but they're not. They're like atheists. The way they live as if God doesn't exist. Why aren't their lives transformed? As the Bible talks about. Why don't they treasure Jesus more than anything else in this world? But they're self-centered. They live for themselves. They live for their own kingdom. They don't live their lives as if they're submitted to God, who is the king, but they themselves are God and they rule themselves and their world. They still struggle with control because they're trying to control their life, what they want. They cannot trust. They don't have faith. The God that you're bigger and greater, but they live for themselves. And so in the midst of all that struggling year after year, I realized I knew it was bad when people were coming to know Jesus. I thought to myself, let's see how long this will last. They will probably fall away. In fact, it was so bad that I, I remember I just got convicted by the Holy Spirit to pray and to repent. And so that's what I did. I, I repented before God and I just said, God, this is, not, this is not what I should be thinking. A pastor, let alone, you know, just a person who believes in this thing, I'm like, I shouldn't be thinking this. And I realized a lot of it was just through my bad experiences with so many people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but they're not following Jesus, but rather they're following their own selves. This is a little bit of my journey. And what I'm going to share, and I'm just going to kind of look at a couple of passages, but a bulk of what I'm going to be sharing today comes out of three books that I think it will be really helpful for some of you if you want to read more on it. We talked a lot about these three books. It was presented by one of, uh, one of my friends, and we were talking through this because it dealt with some of those issues. The three books, the first book is N.T. Wright. It's called The Day the Revolution Began. A phenomenal, it will, it will literally reorient the way you understand the gospel. The second book is Derek Reeland, the N.T. Wright and the Revolutionary Cross. So he was a student or a learner of N.T. Wright. And so he wrote this idea of the revolutionary nature of the cross. And then the last one is Scott McKnight's book, The King Jesus Gospel. What is truly the gospel? It's about God sending his son the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and it will once again reshape the way you understand the gospel. Let me go ahead and read uh, some ex excerpts from uh, the book 
the King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight. He was one of my professors at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, he was always a very unique uh, professor, but I really enjoyed him as he taught on the book of Luke, and he was my New Testament professor there, and now he teaches over at Northern Seminary in Chicago. Listen to what he writes in his book, The King Jesus Gospel. He says this, most of evangelism today is obsessed with getting someone to make a decision. The apostles, however, were obsessed with making disciples. Those two words, decision and disciples, are behind this entire book. Evangelism that focuses on decision, shortcuts, and yes, the word is appropriate, aborts the design of the gospel, while evangelism that aims at uh, disciples slows down the offer, the gospel, full gospel of Jesus and the apostles. So, I mean, think about that for a second. Many of us, when we think about the gospel, when we think about evangelism, we think about sharing it in such a way that someone can make a decision rather than being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't raise your hand, but I'm wondering how many of you have decided to become a Christian because you made this decision. But you know what? You're not a disciple of Jesus. You're a disciple of yourself. You're a disciple of the world. How many of you grew up in the church and you, you can't even remember when you became a Christian? Maybe at five years old when that Sunday school teacher says, who wants to receive Jesus into their heart? And you're like, oh, in my heart, you know, you want to receive Jesus into your heart. And that's why we have so many people who are very churched, grew up in the church, but they're not followers of Jesus Christ. That's why I think the church is so weak, church capital C. That's why we have a lot of legalism. That's why we have a lot of hypocrisy. And the effectual call that God has called us to declare to the world of this gospel message, we have failed time and time again. I think these are the type of quote-unquote, I'm put this in quotes, Christians who fill the church. Of course, not our church. You know, you guys are all awesome. These are the type of Christians that fill the church. They sit there week after week. Maybe you go to life group or you do go to life group and you make it all about meetings. But that's not what Christianity is about. McKnight continues in, in the book, The King Jesus Gospel, and he writes that, and this is the most indictment, greatest indictment for us. Listen to what he says. At the most conservative estimates, we lose at least 50% of those who make decisions, decisions to follow Jesus Christ. We cannot help but conclude that making a decision is not the vital element that leads to a life of discipleship. Much higher correlation can be found between routine Sunday school participation, youth group participation, and families that nurture one into faith. Our focus on getting young people to make decisions, that is, accepting Jesus into our hearts, appears to distort spiritual formation. I want now to say this in a stronger form. So he's ratcheting it up. He's like, if that wasn't bad enough, listen very carefully. Then he says this. I would contend there is a minimal difference in correlation between evangelical children and teenagers who make a decision and who later become genuine disciples and the Roman Catholics who are baptized as infants and who as adults become faithful and devout Catholic disciples. What he's trying to say is there seems to be possibly those who decide to receive Jesus Christ, go through all these things, and then become a disciple later, it's almost the same as those who are Catholics who got baptized and later on become faithful. And let me explain why. I mean, we'll see it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. He goes on and he says this, I am fully aware of the pointedness of this accusation directed as it is at us who have for years contended that we are saved why Roman Catholics are or may not be, but I'm trying to just make, uh, just make just that point. I'm not convinced our system, referring to the evangelicals, that's us, I'm not convinced our system works much more effectively than theirs. I am happy to be proven wrong, but being wrong here won't change the central challenges of this book. One more point, focusing youth events 
retreats and programs on persuading people to make a decision disarms the gospel, distorts numbers, and diminishes the significance of the discipleship. That is so powerful. As I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, how many retreats have we gone to? How many revival meetings have we had? How many of these camps and these different meetings and Friday night encounters, how many things have we offered to you in our church, believing and hoping that your life will be transformed? He is not arguing that we shouldn't have these things. These things are good. Retreats, conferences, all these things are good. But we have relegated to these types of meetings to somehow transform people's lives. I think this is why the conversation I had at this conference with my friends made more sense to me. It really made me rethink about and consider how it is that we're presenting the gospel. That's why even before I touched the book of Romans, I didn't want to touch it because I'm like, wow, this is like a mega book. This is not in terms of size and volume, but in terms of the depth and the theology behind it, because there's so much history. There's so much contextualization. There's so many things in this book. And I'm realizing more and more as we're talking about this issue that our understanding of the gospel has to come out of scripture of the Bible than what the current culture in Christianity is. That's why I think for today, I'm going to go ahead, as I mentioned, pause on the book of Romans. Talk about the simple gospel, revisit it with a new lens, and hopefully through this, now everything we read from this point on in the book of Romans, it will make more sense why Paul shared what he did. So I was thinking about the one thing, and I was thinking, man, we've, we've been messed up. Uh-huh. We done bad. We really messed up. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, we have so many preachers like myself and so many other people who have preached this gospel message, but we were preaching it for a decision. And then people are like, yeah, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah, I want to receive Jesus. So then what happens is that we haven't really taught them that it's about being a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. One thing that I'm thankful for is that over the last couple of years, these are things that we were trying to introduce that's why we talked about the gospel paradigm. We've been teaching some of those things. That's why we talked about the kingdom of God. We've been also teaching about our allegiance to Christ, the king. All these things were like little fragments. But over the past uh, several weeks in this conference, it helped me to put all these pieces together and realize now as your pastor, along with Pastor Bo, as we've been talking about it, we have a responsibility to help you to deepen your understanding of the gospel. So here's the one thing that I want you to remember is this, that our powerless gospel is notorious, not famous, but in a bad way. A powerless gospel is notorious, but God is offering a gospel that is victorious. All right, I want you to read that, turn to somebody next to you and tell them what it is. Come on, let's tell them the one thing. Okay, all right. I pray that we'll leave here realizing the gospel is a glorious thing and it will change our lives. I'm gonna approach it from uh, two angles. First, I wanna talk about the conventional view of salvation, about this gospel. And then I wanna talk about the contextualized and what we understand in scripture and what the writers were talking about when they talked about the gospel. So the first point is really to help expose our belief of this gospel. The second one is to help reframe or relay down the foundation of the gospel. So we're gonna revisit what it really means. And it's not going to be all these like Bible passages. I'm just going to give you a few just to kind of frame it first. And then I'm going to continue to quote from different parts of this book and then share from my own personal experience. And I hope that it will resonate with you and say, man, I really do want to study the book of Romans. I do really want to understand the gospel in a deeper way, not the way I understood it from growing up in the church, not the way I understood it. Maybe if you receive Christ because community was so great and why not be a Christian? If I could enjoy this kind the community all the time, then praise God. And I'm, once again, I want to be careful because some of your experiences are going to be similar to what I'm sharing. It doesn't nullify the work of God. God is working. He's trying to deepen that understanding. Some of you became a Christian through our life group because you love the community, you experience God's love, which is great. 
But it's not just making a decision to be a Christian, but it's a lifestyle. It's what God demands from you, which is your whole life, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So let me talk about the conventional view of salvation. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. This is the first verse that I want to reference to as we talk about this, as we talk about the conventional view. What well, is the typical view? And I will say this. You talk to any churches here in Hong Kong, many of them will hold to this. And so once again, I'm not saying it's wrong. The way I want to look at it is that we were just looking at a small little sliver of the bigger picture. And then we're making conclusions on those things. And then now we're just zooming out and we realize, oh my goodness, there's so much more than we thought. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, listen to what it says. We ourselves are Jews. This is Apostle Paul writing to the people in Galatia. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I hope you caught this right away. We see these, these two concepts that is repeated over just in these two verses. This idea of justified by works. And then the works of the law. Those are the two phrases that we see repeated in these two verses. Now, why is this important? Because you have to understand that if you come from my tradition, which is not Catholic background, uh, but if you believe in the Protestant faith, bottom line is that it came from 1517, long time ago, almost 500 years ago. In 1517, the year 1517, Martin Luther, he started the Protestant Reformation. Those of you who might not know that he was a priest and he was kind of struggling with this idea of justification by faith. He didn't even know that he was struggling with it. All we know was this. Every single time that he was struggling with sin, he would go to the father, which is the priest, and he goes, Father, I have sinned. And the father's like, okay, say these prayers and then go. And then so he'll say these prayers. But then he's looking at that bread that the other friend is eating. He goes, oh, I, I covet that bread. I want more bread. Then he's like, oh, I've sinned. So he goes back to the father, I have sinned. I have coveted my brother's bread. And then he's like, Okay, say these prayers, go. And then he will go and all of a sudden he will do something else. So it was this perpetual cycle of, I need to be forgiven. I need to be made right with God. And all of a sudden, when he read the book of Romans, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Because of the Catholic Church, when there was indulgences, there was mass, there was a, a purgatory, a lot of these doctrinal things that the Catholic Church was pre preaching on, Everything made it about works, what you do, what you do. You got to do this. So the Protestant Reformation was literally a kind of like an opposite force of, it was like the pendulum was swinging over here, works, works, works. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther realized in the book of Romans that it's not by works, but it's by faith. And so that he went so far to the other end, that's how we got the gospel that we have. So I want you to just pause here and let that hit you. The gospel that we have today in 2021, if you're part of the Protestant Reformation or from that tradition, not the Catholic tradition, but from the Protestant Reformation tradition, for the last 500 years, the gospel that we understand right now comes out of that swinging away from the works oriented and towards justification by faith and faith alone. Now, once again, did Pastor Seth turn liberal? Is he like way out there? What is he talking about? Because it is not true. And to that, I would say, yes, it is. But once again, we're just looking at a small piece of the bigger picture of what the gospel is. The doctrine of justification simply means that you are declared righteous through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which then makes us right with God because he became the sacrifice for us, because he paid the penalty of our sins. That's what we teach. That's what you know. And that Jesus took on the full punishment of our sins when he died on the cross. That was the sin that we, just punishment we deserved. So Jesus became what? And we talk about this. He became our substitute as he died on the cross. 
Some of you are like, yeah, pastor, that's what you preach. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. This was the gospel that I knew. This is the gospel that I was preaching for 30 plus some years. But this view of salvation, which centers on justification by faith, as I said before, came out of a response to legalism in the Catholic Church. So can you imagine? As a response to the legalism in the Catholic Church for 500 years, we've been preaching this gospel that's purely about justification by faith, and that's it. That's why this gospel becomes more individualistic, and it becomes more contractual. It's a contract we're making with God now. I repent of my sins. I, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and then I am made right. But I, I want to live what I want to live. This is where Derek Reeland in his book, New N.T. Wright and the Revolutionary Cross, really kind of helps us to understand. The mistakes made by people were an exaggerated emphasis on the individual. The popular assumption had become Jesus died for my sins to take me to heaven when I die and because of, because of my sin, I'm under the wrath of God. Thankfully, my Savior died for me, saving me from my sin and the wrath of God. The problem with this heightened view of the individual was the division it created between personal sins and systemic sins, the sins, the big system of evil in the world. Now, he's touching upon a sore spot. Listen to me. How many of you heard of the Black Lives Matter? How many of you guys heard of all these different things that are going on in the United States and all over the world? What he's touching upon is how in the world can you say you are a believer in Jesus Christ and live your life in such a way that's so contrary to what the Bible teaches? Yes, all lives matter. Why? Because we are made in the image of God. So even those of us who struggle with prejudice or those things of racism, it's a human heart condition, but if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you cannot, you cannot genuinely say you follow Christ and have that in your heart because we're all made in the image of God. I've said this before, and I'm not making a political statement, but let me be clear. Sometimes things become political because we put it in a context, but you need to understand, I am not making a political statement. And I'm going to be clear that if we lose people in our church, then I'm okay with this because I'm preaching from Scripture. It is amazing to see some of the hatred towards the mainland Chinese people from Christians who are local Hong Kong people. I understand this is the place you grew up in. This is the place your mom grew up in, your dad grew up in. I know things are different. But someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, for them to be angry at mainland, that makes sense because it's all about them. But you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That person is made in the image of God. They are lost without Christ. So if we think about some of these movements that are happening, who is it led by? A lot of them are led by Christians, and it just boggles my mind. That's the same case in the United States, that people can vote for a certain president or certain people can do certain things, but you look and you realize, how can this be? You look at the statistics of people inside the church and those who are outside of the church in all different areas, divorce, whatever it may be, and it's identical. It's similar. So I don't know about you, but it feeds my cynicism and sometimes my anger because I'm thinking of myself and I'm thinking, what, what is to use? Why should, we, why should I even preach this gospel message if it's not transforming lives? We're no different then the people in our dorm rooms, in our classes, in our workplaces, all we're different is that we're a Christian. We get to go to heaven now. No wonder people outside of the church hate us. Because they look at us, we're the same way. And we just act more self-righteous. Because somehow we, we're, we're saved by faith. That is not the gospel that Jesus taught. 
Amen. Man, this is, this is when the church people are like, okay, Lord, come on. I don't know what you're doing. So as I shared earlier, salvation through the gospel has become more of fire insurance. Oh, I heard, I heard hell is hot and there's a lot of fire. So here's this fire insurance that you can get if you would just put your trust in Jesus Christ. This is why there's so much nominalism in the church. This is why there's so much self-centered Christians in the church. This is why so many people live for themselves rather than the kingdom of God. That's why you can have materialistic, self-centered people who say, I'm a Christian and no different from somebody who's materialistic and self-centered in the world. <laughs> you know what we do? Oh, I'm, well, I'm using my gifts and talents for the Lord to make a lot of money. But you know what they're really doing? This is my kingdom. This is my world. I want to live for comfort. I want to live for things of this world so I can have all these things. So that's why I'm putting so much time and energy in my workplace. I will believe you if you show me your bank account and how much you give to the poor and to the people who are in need and how much you tithe. Then I'll believe you. You're no different. You just have this label of a Christian because you made this decision to follow Christ because it became fire insurance. But you're just like the world. What has happened is that instead of sharing the gospel as if it is this new realm of the kingdom of God, that yes, through faith in Jesus Christ, you are now living the life that God has intended you to live. And it has to be different. That the emphasis is no longer on me and me receiving Jesus, but the emphasis is about God's creation, about the purpose of humanity. It's about God's solution that is found in Jesus Christ. And this understanding that it's more than just a sin issue, but we have to restore to the full calling that God has given us as followers of Jesus Christ. That's why this powerless gospel is notorious for bringing people into the church and just being content rather than this gospel that is so glorious that causes us to live our lives totally radically transformed. So that's the conventional view. Let me quickly go to the second thing, which is now the contextual. Now I'm going to try to reframe some of our mindset. I want to talk about the contextualized view of the gospel or the salvation of through the gospel. More and more, scholars are actually rethinking about the gospel and this idea of salvation. And what they do, are doing right now is they're trying to put it in the context and ask themselves, what did Paul really mean? What did Jesus really mean? What was he trying to say? And as they were doing that, they realized, oh my goodness, we've just focused too much on this and not so much on this. Now, once again, I want, I, I'm sad that I have to keep on saying this because whenever someone talks about like this kind of language, the stuff that I'm bringing up, they're going to automatically label you as liberal. They're going to all automatically say, oh, that's heresy. It's only about justification by faith alone, and that's it. And I'm just like, well, I believe that. But it's bigger than that. So we're, we're, I am not dismissing the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We needed that for us to not only be saved, but to fulfill our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. But the point is that if we make salvation just about justification by faith, then we're not honoring the Jewish context in which Paul and Jesus and others were writing in the Bible that we have today. Because the issue was never trying to get in a right status with God. Remember this. This is so important. The Jewish people in the Bible, they did not struggle with earning salvation by works. That's not what they were struggling with. The self-effort or this, this idea of by them doing something. Why is this important? Because they were the chosen people of God. They already knew this. Just the way we as Christians that we are chosen by God, they believed that they were chosen by God. 
So they weren't struggling with the, they weren't struggling with this idea of being justified with God. L- let, let me explain it this way. I think because I was sitting there, I'm like, how do I make this understandable? And I realized this is maybe this, this is just a minor illustration, but hopefully it will give you at least some deeper understanding. Can, can I ask how many of you are working? Just slip up your hands. Just go ahead, slip up your hands. Okay, a good a lot of you. Put your hand down. What if the manager? Your manager comes up to you one morning and he said, hey, I've been looking over our stats and our sheets, and bottom line is we're here to make money. I don't care what you do, but just make money. So think about that. Now your job is on the line. You have this pressure like, okay, we got to make money. That's, that's just like the bottom line. It's all about making money. So guess what you do? Some of you are working with clients. Some of you are working in different things. So like everything you do is all about making money. But the irony is this. As you're thinking about making money, you're treating people in in a way that it's like not good. You're you're doing a lot of things maybe under the books. You're trying to do things because the bottom line is about making money. But as I said, the irony is this. When you focus on making money, then you realize at the end, you might not actually be making money. Does that make sense? Because let's say the way you treat people, they're not going to buy your product. Then you're not going to make what? Money. But we just focus on making money. This translates into ministry. When we serve and do ministry, it's for what? It's for God and to love people and to help people to understand who Jesus is. But sometimes as we get focused on like evaluations and do all that, what, what, oh, we're going to do these perfectly. So we focus on doing things perfectly. So sometimes we don't love people. We don't do all this kind of stuff. And guess what? The very thing that we're supposed to be doing, we're not doing. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So this is what so many of these scholars and the way as I reread some of these passages, I'm like, okay, for 500 years, Justification by faith and how we understand it, where it was more individual, it was because of this one man who was struggling with this idea of faith. And so now for 500 years, that's been the teaching, the solid gold, gold standard teaching. And we forget that that is true, but it's more than that. This is why you can get people who say, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, get baptized and still live for themselves. You see that in the church. This is why they can say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, get baptized, and still cheat on exams and in the workplace. There's no difference. Then what is it? What is the contextualized view of salvation through the Bible? I'm going to be looking at the time here quickly. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 10. I'm going to read it for us. It's going to be up here. We'll talk about the contextualization of this. I'm going to read through 1 through 10. And as, we're, as I'm reading this, try to understand what Paul is trying to say. This is Paul speaking to the Christians in Corinth. He says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. So he, he, he mentions the gospel now. Of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the wor- uh, word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. So this idea of the gospel being preached. As we continue, it says in verse 3, For I delivered to you as a first important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. I want you to focus in on that phrase, in accordance to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to uh, uh, Cyphus, who then to the twelve, that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of which are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, which means that they passed away, they died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Now, when we read this passage, We're like, okay, the gospel is Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And this is the gospel that we preach. 
What I want you to understand is, is that phrase, in accordance to the scriptures. Can I ask you a question? And if you want to answer, you can answer. Did the early disciples have the Bible at this time? The answer is no. This is Paul writing this to the people of Corinth, but we did not have the Bible at this time when he was writing this. So when the Bible says, according to the scriptures, when Paul says, according to the scripture, what scriptures is he referring to? He's referring to the Old Testament, the writings of the Jewish people. That's according to the scripture. So that's the Torah, the first five books, and also some of the writings of the prophets. Especially Isaiah, because there's a lot of imagery about Jesus coming, the Messiah. So what Paul is saying is, this gospel message that you have heard, or that you know, is according to the scriptures. Not the Bible that we have today, but according to the Old Testament scriptures. So with that in mind, you have to ask yourself, then what is the gospel that's according to the scriptures? It's not just about justification by faith, because they didn't struggle with that. That was something that happened in 1517, which we've been propagating for the last 500 years. So what is the Bible talking about when it says according to the scriptures? Well, maybe the way we could look at it is this. Do you remember the calling for the Jewish people? Go all the way back to Genesis. We go back to Genesis and Abraham, he's, you know, he was known as Abram, so he was kind of chilling. And as he was kind of chilling, God speaks to him. Abraham, and he chose Abraham. because I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And Abraham's like, cool. And then he goes, I want you to now go, take your family, and leave this country, and go to another place that I have for you. So he leaves. He obeys. And the covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant that was constantly renewed with Isaac, Jacob, and many, and Joseph, and many of the forefathers all the way through. And what was that covenant? Listen to me. This is important. This is according to the scriptures. It was renewed also in Exodus chapter 19. I'm not going to look at it, but let, just I want you to think about it for a second. As they were wandering in the wilderness, God told the Israelite people through Moses that I have chosen you to be this kingdom of priests, to be able to declare to those people, to, to the nations. It was reiterated by some of the prophets where he says, you, the Jewish people, are supposed to, what? Not only understand this covenant that I made with you, but you are supposed to be a light for the Gentiles. So the gospel, according to the scriptures that Paul is referencing to, is the Jewish people understanding their calling and what they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do. The Jewish people were the chosen people of God and they were supposed to be the light for the Gentiles. That's what they were called, supposed to call to be and what they were supposed to do. But due to their worship of other gods, what happened? They forsook their calling. They failed to live out their destiny that God had for them. And this is what some theologians call a covenant of vocation. Everyone say that. A covenant of vocation. Let's say it one more time. A covenant of vocation. A covenant of vocation is a job given to humanity by God, which was to reflect God's image as an image bearer. I was made in the image of God. You were made in the image of God. This covenant of vocation was, this was our job to be able to look and reflect the image of God to the world. And we ought to do that is because then all of creation, as they see the gloriousness of who God is, they will give praise back up to God. Just look through the scriptures and with that lens and you realize, oh my God, I've been seeing so many things in a different way. It's kind of like when you wear glasses and you have all the smudge marks, you're like, huh, huh. All of a sudden someone goes, ha, ha, ha. And you put it on, you're like, wow. Or your phone, and you get one of those wipes, you know, wipe it clean, you're like, wow. 
That's exactly what's happening. When you understand this vocation, the covenant of vocation is that our calling is supposed to be the image bearers of God, that we are now supposed to proclaim the good news of God through Jesus Christ and so that others can then know and give praise back to the Creator. But as you know, the problem with the Israelites and also with us as believers is that we continue to fail in fulfilling our vocation. It's because of our disobedience. And this is the story of the Bible for the Israelite people time and time again. They failed to live up to their calling and to their vocation, which was to be a life for the Gentiles. Now, our main task, through the salvation of Jesus Christ, that comes through Jesus Christ, we are to fulfill the calling of being an image bearer of God. We're not here just to be safe, but we are called to be the image bearers of God. What is the deeper issue that caused the disobedience as we talked about last week? It was idolatry. That's why I wanted to, how many of you guys, okay, don't raise your hand. Uh, if you have been doing the BRP, we've been reading this book called what? Ezekiel. And I pray for, for the rest of the next couple of weeks as you read it, I want you to look at it through, through this lens and you'll be like, oh my goodness, this makes more sense now. What was God trying to rebuke the Israelite people of? It was idolatry. They failed to live up to their calling as the people of God, chosen by God, and to then become the light bearers, to shine the image bearers to the world, which was supposed to be the life of the Gentiles. That's why God sent punishment. That's why God was, he says, my wrath is upon you because you're not doing the thing that I've called you to do. That's why Jesus had to come. And when he died on the cross, what he did was now he was supposed to help shine the light to the Gentiles. That's why when he first came, what did he say? I did not come for the Gentiles. I came for what? The lost sheep of Israel. He came for the Israelite people because they were supposed to do what they were supposed to do, which is to be the people of God and then to also be a life for the Gentiles. But because they failed to do that in their pride, in their disobedience, in their idolatry, Jesus came and now through him we have access as not as a Jewish person, but as a Gentile, a non-Jew, to be a part of God's kingdom. Let me give you some of these quotes, and I, I hope this makes sense. Uh, Derek Relin in his book, N.T. Wright and the Revolutionary Cross, says this, The primary problem for which human beings need rescue is idolatry and the corruptive forces unleashed on the earth when human beings rejected the worship of the one true God and began to worship idols. The death of Jesus restores us to our original vocation and being God's image-bearing caretakers of God's world. Sin implies a failure of that vocation. Idolatry lying at the root of sin represents humanity's fundamental rejection of that vocation. So bottom line is that if there are idols in your life, you are rejecting the very thing that God has given you as you become a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen to what N.T. Wright says. Uh, he says something similar. He goes this, the diagnosis of the human plight is then not simply that humans have broken God's moral law, offending and insulting the creator whose image they bear, though that it may, uh, it is true as well. So once again, a lot of us, we think of this, oh, we broke God's laws. Oh, we need to be forgiven. Oh, we need to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What N.T. Wright is saying is those things are all true, but there's more. This law breaking is a symptom of much more serious disease. Morality is important, but it's it's it isn't the whole story. Call to responsibility and authority within and over the creation, humans have turned their vocation upside down, giving worship and allegiance to forces and powers within creation itself. The name for this is idolatry. The result is slavery and finally death. It isn't just that humans do wrong things so incur in punishment. This is one element of the larger problem. When we worship and serve forces within the creation, we hand over our power to other forces, only too happy to usurp our position. We humans have thus, by abrogating our own vocation, handed our power and authority to non-divine and non-human forces, which have then run rampant, spoiling human beings, ravishing the beautiful creation, and doing their best to turn God's world into hell, and hence into a place from which people might want to escape. Some of these forces are familiar. Money, sex, power. I hope you're catching that. You have to catch it to understand what I'm trying to communicate here. This is where my mind is like, wow, this is, this, this is why. 
is not just about forgiving your sins, but we have a calling to be image bearers of God in God's kingdom, to declare the gloriousness of who God is. That's why it's called the good news, the gospel. It sets us free. But what we have done is by idolatry, we have given over that divine power that is given to us. We have given over to the works of the evil one, the authority that God has given to us. That's why when Jesus died, resurrected from the dead, he spoke to his disciples, he goes, now all authority has been given to whom? To me. And now I say, go and make disciples. He's giving this authority to the disciples. Because now as we worship the idols of our lives, we're giving the thing that is rightfully ours to those things. And that's why our world is flipped upside down. That's why the world is not the way it's supposed to be right now. When you see all the problems that are on the news, when you think about that is not the way it's supposed to be. That's why we need Christ followers who understand the gospel, who will engage the world. Listen to what Derek Reeland says again in his book. He says, God created humanity in God's image to reflect God's love into the world. Humanity has sinned by worshiping as God that which is not God and enslaving themselves to the point where they reflect a broken image into the world. That's us trying to become a Christian, but that's not the image. Humanity needs to be freed, healed, and transformed back into God's image-bearing creatures. This freedom and healing comes through condemning sin and breaking the power of sin, which comes through Jesus Christ. That's why our powerless gospel is so notorious for keeping Christians in this comfortable bubble. But when you understand what God is offering to us, it is this gospel that is glorious, that will transform your life. That's why those who really understand the gospel message, their life is flipped upside down. That's why they are more secure than ever before. That's why they are more free to love people than ever before. They don't do it because they have to. They do it because they want to, because they've been loved by God. They've been set free by God. And through this good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a good amen to that? That is what is the transformative power of the gospel really looks like. So then the question is this, pastor, okay, fine. Okay, you got me a little bit, but then what is the gospel? Well, we kind of looked at it and I need to read some of these things to help us to understand. So once again, these three books, it's a little bit of kind of insight to a lot of the stuff that I'm sharing. Scott McKnight says this, but we have to ask whether the apostles define the gospel in this way, just about justification by faith, I believe the word gospel has been hijacked by what we believe about personal salvation. And the gospel itself has been reshaped to facilitate making decisions. The result of this hijacking is that the word gospel no longer means in our world what it originally meant to either Jesus or the apostles. Wow, that was, that's pretty convicting. Every time we use the word gospel, we understand it as a decision. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross. And then you receive Jesus Christ. And he says, that's not what the apostles and that's not what Jesus was talking about. If you put it in the context. He continues and he says this, Paul does not now articulate how Jesus death did something for our sins. This is so true. I was trying to read through this. I'm like, wow, I don't see it anywhere. Paul does not articulate. He does not communicate how Jesus' death did something for our sins. He only tells us that Jesus actually died for our sins. Are you with me? Does that make sense? It says Jesus died for our sins. It doesn't tell us now how and what does it do for us. However, we tell the story of Jesus, that story must deal with sin and it must deal with those sins as something for which Jesus died. We are led to see that the gospel has the power to unveil the saving impact of Jesus' death. So it's Jesus died for our sins. And through that, now we unpackage it and realize that because he has died for our sins, it allows us to experience all these things. So what is the purpose of Jesus' death? Well, N.T. Wright, which I thought was really interesting, it does, it does justify us. It does do all those things that we, we have talked about before. But he proposes that the purpose of Jesus' death was, first of all, it was about defeating the evil powers. Do you remember what Jesus said in, or excuse me, what Paul said to the people of Corinth? He says, oh, death, where is your what? Sting. Where is your sting? Because that was the last thing that the power of evil head over people because he could kill you and then it's gone. You're gone. But when Jesus died and rose again from the dead, that even through your death, it's not over because Christ is victorious. 
He rose again from the dead. That means that we will be resurrected from the dead one day. And the second thing he says is that it reveals the love of God. The most famous passage of the gospel, John 3, 16. I, I want you to read it up here. And some of you memorized it, but I just want you to try to settle on each of these words. It says, for God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I'm trying to marinate on scripture, trying to reemphasize, all right? That whoever believes in him, so for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The two words I want you to focus in on is so loved and also he gave. The gospel is about God whose heart is so broken because his plan was for the Adam and Eve to rule over this earth. But in their sin, they were cast it away. And God still in his loving ways decided I'm going to make a covenant with my people through Abraham. That through Abraham, the whole world will come to know him. But guess what? They failed again because they kept on worshiping idols. They wanted a king when they had God. That's why the book of Judges talk about how they kept on sinning in a circular fashion over and over again. And then finally, Jesus, God says, I'm sending my son. Because I'm going to restore all my purposes through my son. And what he's going to do on the earth so that when he dies on the cross, resurrects from the dead, that the purpose of being an image bearer of God can now be given and be restored so that we can live the life that God has called us to live, which is now to be a light to the Gentiles, to take this gospel to the nations. It's that simple. That through Jesus' death, evil has now been conquered because Jesus, the conquering king, and God so loved the world that he gave. Of course, through Jesus Christ, as you place your faith in him, that we can restore our calling as the image bearers of God. So the goal of salvation is not to go to heaven. Listen, the goal of salvation is not to go to heaven, but to be fully restored image bearers who accomplish God's will on this earth. I'm going to skip over some of these things. And one question that comes up is, okay, pastor, the reason why there's such a strong delineation or like argument for faith alone is because there are a lot of people who emphasize works, legalism. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question, so I want you to sit there and just think about it. If some of you who believe that it's by faith and faith alone that we, which we then be saved, then where does works come in? Also in your BRP, we've been reading the small little book called what? James. Wow, it's amazing how just God knows. And James says, faith without works is what? It's dead. The Protestant Reformation was so against legalism, which is rooted in works, that all they emphasized was faith alone. That's why we have seen a lot of people who goes, oh, don't tell me to do anything. I don't want to serve on a ministry team. I don't, I'm, I don't want to bring a birthday cake. Don't, don't tell me to do anything because it's about faith alone. But what I would like to propose to you is that Faith without deeds or works is dead, which simply means if you are genuinely saved, you will what? Work. I thought the quote by Dallas Willard will give you some tremendous insight because there's a phrase that he says that I'm like, that's a good phrase. That's a good one thing. Listen to what he writes. 
The teaching of salvation by grace through faith has in many quarters brought people to a condition where they really don't know what they are supposed to do. Currently, we are not only saved by grace, we are paralyzed by it. There is deep confusion. We find it hard to see that grace is not opposed to effort, but it's opposed to earning. Earning and effort are not the same thing. Earning is an attitude, and grace is definitely opposed to that, but it is not opposed to effort. When you see a person who has been caught on fire by grace, you are apt to see some of the most astonishing efforts you can imagine. Grace is a tremendous motivator and energizer when you understand and receive it rightly. Grace is against earning, but grace is not against effort. That's why, can we go back to the 1 Corinthians passage, 15? I want you to see this. Okay? If not, I'll, I'll just read it. Can you go to the last verse 9? Nine, 9 and this is what it says. For, this is Paul. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This guy is understanding what God's grace is about. But by the grace of God, which he clearly states, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I what? Worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Do you see that? The grace of God and worked are together. So what I'm trying to say is that some of you right now are doing a lot of things for God, trying to obey the law, trying to do quiet time, trying to do all this stuff, but you are trying to earn salvation or trying to earn favor points with God. That's why some of you get bitter when you have to serve. That's why some of you don't want to give. Some of you don't want to do these things. That just shows that you don't understand the grace of God and this gospel message. But as Dallas Willard said, if your heart is caught on fire, as you understand what the grace of God is, then you will lay down your life and work for this gospel, not because you earned it, but what? This effort is because it's a response to what God has done. That's why in Romans chapter 12, Apostle Paul says, in view of God's mercies, in all that God has done, in view of his mercies that I have received, I've experienced to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's why every single time I look at believers, and I'm going to put that in quotes, and you're just kind of content with your life, and you're not willing to lay down your life for the gospel, then I have to question, have you experienced the gospel, or is this contractual works where you're like, I want fire insurance, okay, I just have to believe, and that's it. Or some of you who are working so hard and doing all this stuff, but you have the wrong motive, the wrong attitude, and it's easy for you to get bitter, easy for you to complain, then that shows that you're trying to earn something from God. But it's those people who serve, lay down their life, even willing to go to some of the hardest places and even risk their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're the ones their heart has been set on fire by this grace. God not only loves you, but he has conquered death and the, and the grave. And what he has intended from the beginning of time, which is for us to be image bearers of God, to then live out our calling as a kingdom of priests. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 2, that's what he talks about in 9 and 10. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God, that he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Why is he saying that? It's because our purpose and our calling in life is connected to what's God's greater purpose, which is what? As image bearers of God, to shine the light of Jesus Christ wherever we go. If your gospel and your understanding of being saved is just contractual, or if it's just forgiveness of sins, then you have truncated the gospel. You've distorted it in such a way that you feed the nominalism. You feed the half-heartedness. You feed the hypocrisy. That's why your life has not changed ever since you became a Christian. You're just now named by Christian, but then you are not living the life that God has intended. 
Look at some of these people around you who have genuinely experienced the gospel when they understand the purpose. It's not just forgiveness of sins. But now we are restored in a right relationship with God, but also we are part of this greater kingdom of God. We have this king. We are his subjects. We lay down our lives for him. And that's when we will be able to say, Lord Jesus, take my life, all of me. Ah, skip, 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 skip. <gasps> Let me just, I was just preparing this. I'm like, oh, then. And then in Romans 2, then I'm like, no, that's going to be five sermons right there. So I said, okay. I'm going to close. I will. With two things. I'm going to summarize what I shared in five sentences. And I'm going to give you some next steps. And we're just going to pray and we're going to ask God to come and meet us. I think there needs to be some spirit of repentance. I think some of you will have this awakening. That my hand, my whole understanding of Christianity was just forgiven of my sin. But there's something greater, something more glorious. The first sentence is this. Salvation through the gospel has been viewed in a contractual way for the last 500 years due to legalism, which is the works contract view. So I established that. The second statement is this. God's story of salvation is better understood from a covenant of vocation, which focuses on our calling as God image bearers to reflect God's purpose. The second statement is this, or third Idolatry is the heart of the issue. Therefore, we must address the heart. Number four, salvation through the gospel is more than just getting saved, but rather it is about the kingdom of God coming down to heaven, that Jesus is our king. He's here. He lives amongst us, and we could be a part of this great kingdom and do great things for Jesus. And the last statement is this. We, as the image bearers of God, have a purpose to co-labor with God in bringing the reality of heaven here on this earth. That is our purpose. Some of you sit there and go, I don't know what my purpose is. What am I supposed to do, Pastor? I don't know. I hate my job. I don't like to do this. But I'm telling you, because then you have such a contractual view of the gospel. Understand the bigger picture of the gospel, and you realize, wow, I'm part of something that's even bigger than myself. And I pray that with the gifts that you have, the things that God has given you, that you can live it out with great purpose. Here's some next stuff, uh, next steps as I talk about here. First thing is this, is assess your understanding of the gospel. Man, some of you have to do some hard work of just assessing, how do I understand the gospel? Oh, it was just about Jesus dying on the cross, forgiving of my sins. It doesn't mean it's not, it's true. But at that, it's just a truncated view. There's something greater. So assess how you came to know Christ. How did you come to know Christ? Maybe some of you have to think through and like, man, I just got a little glimpse. It was like a preview. You know those trailers? You're like, whoa, it sounds so cool. Yeah, but then there's all two hours of it. The second thing is this. Ask others about your transformation. <laughs> this is so good. Mom, am I transformed? No, you're so selfish. You don't clean your bed. I don't know. You know ask other people. Hey, man, you've, you know me from like eighth grade. Do you see any transformation in me? <laughs> no, you're the same, man. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> but if you're like, yeah, man, you changed a lot. Your priorities, everything you're doing, it's completely different. Ask your life group leader when you were a freshman to now. I'm like, yeah, you're still the same. <laughs> loving yourself, loving the things of this world. Ask other people about your transformation. It will give you some insights. Number three, address the idols of your heart. This is the heart of the issue. We do not want Jesus the king because we ourselves want to be kings. Kings and queens. Lay those things aside. Find out what grips you, what scares you, what you're motivated by, what, what, what drives you, what gets up in the morning. Address the idols of your heart. Fourth is allow God to do the work of transformation. He has to do it. But you got to allow him. You can say, God, here's my life. Do whatever you want. I offer it to you. And lastly, apply the gospel on a daily basis. Every single day to be able to say, Jesus, you died 
not only forgave my sin, but you've called me to this purpose. I'm supposed to be the image bearer of you. So when people see me, they will see you. They'll see your purpose. When you fail, you realize this is, this is not my identity. I'm not a failure, but I'm a child of God who failed. So Lord, I come before you humbly. This is where your life will be transformed. We are so known for this powerless gospel. It's notorious. You see it in the church. You see it amongst your friends. You see it everywhere. But today, this morning, God is offering you a gospel that is so much more glorious that will turn your life around. I pray that we will receive it and we will live by it because it is changing us and it's going to transform the world. Let's stand together. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.